Hey everyone, Aaron from The Impatient Gardener. Today I want to talk to you about some notable annuals in my garden this year. I grow a lot of annuals and I love growing annuals for a lot of reasons, including that it is a very low commitment way to play around with new looks in your garden. You're just committed to it for one year. If you liked it, you can repeat it the next year. And if you didn't, you try something different. It can actually also be kind of a low cost way to fill up a garden if you're growing from seed. Of course, purchasing annuals can become expensive, but I find that it's worth purchasing some annuals just to get that look. And sometimes you can kind of maximize those in different ways as well. So today I just want to run through a few annuals that are really notable in the garden this year. Um, there's a whole list of them that I could talk about, but I'm gonna to try to keep it limited to a handful of ones that I've grown from seed and a handful that I've purchased. And the first one I wanna talk about is ageratum. I grow ageratum from seed every year. It's one of my favorite plants to just pop in along a border because I love blue flowers. So there are a ton of different ageratums out there on the market. I've grown blue Hawaii a lot. That's a very short one. So that's great for right at the front on the border. But this one is blue horizon and I quite like this one. It's a taller one. For me, it gets about 18 to 20 inches, but apparently it can get much bigger than that. Um, and I just kind of pop it in and it flops like nicely. It doesn't go straight down. It just sort of has these kind of arching stems. If you were growing this for cut flowers, you'd want to make sure that it was growing upright so you'd have nice straight stems. But I've picked a couple for you to see here. Um, now this one is kind of shaggy. These flowers are sort of towards the end of their life. This is kind of a newer flower with the cute little balls still in there. But I just think it adds um, great color to the garden. And the great thing this year is that most of the ageratum I had growing actually self-seeded itself from last year's flowers. That was a bit of a surprise for me. It's not happened before. I hope it keeps happening because I find ageratum to be a little, it's not the easiest thing to grow from seed. It's not particularly difficult, but it doesn't grow as easily as some other things. And I'd be really happy if it just reseeded in the garden because this year I moved it around anywhere I wanted it. It transplanted great. So if it's going to keep reseeding in the garden, that's a great way for me to just continue growing ageratum. Next up in my list of notable annuals that I'm growing this year from seed are profusion zinnias. Now profusion zinnias are lower growing kind of bunching zinnias. This is not like a cutting zinnia. This is definitely to be grown in the border or they work fabulous in pots um, and they just keep pumping out the blooms once you get them going. That's where things kind of went awry for me this year was the getting them going part. I grew them from seed um, and I had some issues from seed. First of all, I had some poor germ uh, germination on them. Um, also, they seem to take a long time to get going, longer than most zinnias, and I also dealt with some mislabeling issues. So let me show you uh, the three that I'm growing this year. So first up is uh, just Perfusion White, just the most basic, creamy white, simple flower. Um, I, I love these flowers. I think they're just simple and delightful and charming. Then we have this beautiful double deep salmon, which is really more orange than it is pink, but it definitely gets some pink color variation on it as those blooms age. And lastly is this beautiful double white zinnia. Funny looking for a double white zinnia, right? So this brings me to the, one of the issues I had. My plan was to grow the single white and the double white zinnias together in a big mass, and I thought that would look really cool. Well, this is what all of my double white zinnias came up looking like. Clearly the entire packet was mislabeled, and I think this is, must be, I should look in the series, but I, this must be like a hot pink or something. It's a beautiful color. There's gorgeous color on this. It's just not exactly the look I was going for. So I actually ended up buying some more white Perfusion Zinnias from Home Depot. I just, they had them in a little six pack. And had I known they would have them, I wouldn't have bothered starting them from seed. To me, these, these plants are um, a little bit high maintenance when you're starting them from seed. So that if I could find these, from, if I could know that I was gonna find these as available as plants, I would skip growing these from seed in the future. Um, it's just kind of not, sometimes I feel like when you have limited space and limited amount of time to dedicate to that, you wanna really focus on the things that you know you're not gonna be able to find. However, I don't wanna be without these. So in particular, this double deep salmon is a real winner in my mind. So in the future, I will 
you know, try to find these from plants. Um, maybe even ask around from some places whether they're going to be carrying them or not and just plan on buying them. And if not, I'll probably just keep growing them from seed um, because they're worth it to me. Those of you who know my garden know that we could not get through this discussion of annuals without talking about Nicotiana. Um, I love Nicotiana. I love growing different varieties of it and playing around with it. And it's a big part of my garden. And this is sort of the star of the show. This is a lot of lime, Nicotiana, a lot of lime green. And how can you not love that chartreuse color, right? I love planting these in big clumps to just get a lot of this color. This is a color that to me, goes with everything in a garden and can really tie a garden together. Now, another one of my favorites is Nicotiana Langsdorfii, which you can see is an even more chartreuse green, but these tiny little bells. Uh, this is really a favorite of the hummingbirds. They love this one. Um, I like this one too. It doesn't grow in masses as well. It's sort of better to, in my garden, to just kind of pop around for a little bit of accent. And then when you uh, combine, a lot of lime green and Langsdorfii, a lot of times you will come up, um, things, these do not come true to seed. So when you save the seed, you come up with something sort of in between. So here's all three of them together and you can see that a lot of times the in-between one has that same chartreuse color, but a slightly smaller flower. Um, and this is often what pops up in my garden when it reseeds itself. Now, I have other ones too, which are interesting, uh, new ones to me this year. This first one I think is called Tinkerbell and uh, very similar to Langsdorfii with the tiny little tubular type flower. But if you look inside of it, you can see that it has this beautiful kind of rosy pink coppery color. Um, very pretty. I don't have a lot of this that came up even though I grew this from seed. I'm pretty sure I got this from uh, Floret. So I don't know if it just didn't do well when I transplanted it or I didn't grow much of it, um, but it's fun. Should be used, I think, in the same way that that Langstorphia is kind of intermittently popped about. Now I also have a few others that are growing this year. These two are part of the Perfume series. So this is um, Perfume Deep Purple. Uh, these are both F1 hybrids. And this is Perfume Bright Rose. I believe at least one of these, if not both of these, are um, All-America selection winners. What's nice about these is obviously they pack a huge punch, big flowers, great color. They're only two feet tall. And that is really nice because these never need staking. The Nicotiana Alata Lime Green can get quite tall, more than three feet, and often leans and I end up finding myself needing to stake it. There are several other colors in this perfume series and and by the way, there is no scent now. Most Nicotianas um, don't get their scent, their evening scented flowers. One of the colors in this series is a lime green. There's also an antique lime. I have grown the antique lime before and did not care for it. It was a very washed out color. Um, but if, there was a, if that lime green is really good, I might start growing more of this rather than that a lot of lime. Um, just because the height would be easier to control. And I think these big flowers really pack such a nice punch that they would look really good in a border. By the way, this time of year, I get a lot of questions about how you deadhead Nicotiana. So these are all spent flowers on here. So these are all seed pods, and that's where your seed is going to come from. And if you just have these flowers at the end, it does look a little sparse. So I do one of two things. First of all, I will just pull any brown flowers off no matter what, because they're not very attractive to look like if they don't fall off on their own. You can, if you want, cut this back to a leaf node. There's a lot of times there's another set of buds coming there. It will reflush, so you absolutely can do that. Or you can do some combination of the two if you want to start saving some seeds from it. Nicotiana seeds are like dust, so you will get a ton of seeds out of one, one little pot. The last seed grown annual I want to talk to you about is this one. This is the hardest plant to show you on a video or take a photograph of but it's so cool in the garden. This is Verbena Bampton. And I grew it two years ago uh, using the winter sowing method, which is the only way I've ever really had success growing any Verbena. Um, and I don't have any success, generally speaking, with winter sowing. I don't do a lot of it because I just don't have great success with it. This was a success from two years ago. Then I didn't grow it this year, but 
Luckily for me, it reseeded and it reseeded in the best possible places. So it has these sort of um, wiry stems. It's, it's tallish. I mean, it's probably all of three feet tall. It has these sort of wiry stems and it grows flowers. It just keeps producing flowers all along the length of the stem. So there's always a flower blooming on it. It's just that all you end up with is this tiny little flower on the end. But these stems are this nice purple. So they're very pretty and it adds this ethereal um, texture in the garden, which is great in gardens like mine where you've got so much stuff packed in that it feels, it can get kind of dense feeling. And then you end up with a plant like this in there and it just, um, it just makes everything feel lighter and fresher. It's also fabulous in bouquets because this texture coming out of a kind of natural bouquet is really a winner. So, um, I'm just hoping, I don't know that I'll try to grow it from seed again because like I said, I found it kind of difficult to do that, but it's gonna, if it's gonna keep receding in my garden, that is the best case scenario. So I will make sure to leave this, let this stand and um, hope that it reseeds prolifically next year and move it around. But it's really funny that this year, the places where it planted itself were places I maybe wouldn't have put it and it's perfect, perfectly placed. So that is a major winner in the garden this year. Now I want to talk to you about um, just three annuals that I grew this year that I purchased. And the first is this one. It's a sweet potato vine. This is from Proven Winners. It's called Sweet Caroline Medusa Green. The green part's important. I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, this is apparently a new plant. I thought they had said it was for next year, but I found it widely available in garden centers this year. And that's a great thing because I planted a ton of it. I have it growing in the ground along the edge of the patio garden, and I have it in both the window box and the urn, and it grows equally well both in the ground and in those containers, and I love it. So first of all, the main thing to note about it is this great foliage. I mean, First of all, let's just say, I understand that getting excited about a sweet potato vine is difficult to do because we've all had them, we all know what they do. This one is a little different. It's the deeply lobed foliage that you know attracts me to this plant to begin with. But this is not an out of control sweet potato vine. It does not, it is not a total water hog. It wants water, but it doesn't suck it up from all the other plants in a container. So that's not an issue. I haven't had to do any supplemental watering of it in the ground. It's just managing with, which, with what's ever there um, that kind of trickles down from anything else I might be watering. And that's saying something because it's been a very dry year here. It also doesn't eat up other plants in a container. It just stays very contained in a nice ball. Um, the foliage has remained very clean. Very few things have really affected it. I haven't seen a lot of bug damage on it, even slugs, which have been bad. Um, the only thing is, is that sometimes underneath there, you'll get a couple little yellow leaves that you have to kind of pick out that are just getting shaded out, but that's it. The green part of this is interesting to me because although I have no inside information on this, it suggests to me that there might be more medusas coming down the line. So maybe we will see a purple or a red leaf one, and maybe we'll even see one. I don't know if you can see this, but it has these really pretty uh, purple leaves on it or purple veins on it. And maybe we'll see one that really draws out those purple veins. I happen to just love this plain color. It's a very nice limey green, so it's bright, but not uh, yellowy. And uh, this is a star. I will, I will plant this probably for a really long time because I'm really smitten with this plant. Next up is this fabulous salvia. This is called White Flame. I first saw this plant last year at the Ball Horticultural Gardens and really fell in love with it. In fact, I talked about it in a video last year. And the thing that I loved about it then and still love about it now is that even after the flowers, when the flowers aren't there, these little white things are sticking out of the flowers, the rest of that is just the calyx. It has this silvery, white silvery calyx on it, which means that it looks good even when it's not fully blooming. Now you can, of course, deadhead this and more flowers will come, but I haven't been inclined to do that because I think it looks beautiful like this. Now, if you grow, if you've grown some of the, um, like the Rockin' series from Proven Winners, though you know that those get huge. And I would say this plant is about half of that. I'm only growing one this year because I didn't quite know, I wasn't planning on finding it. And then I found it and I wanted to just try it out. Uh, and so I'd say this is about half the size. Um, it, it does lean a little bit. I mean, it's got kind of a looser habit, at least where I'm growing it, um, but not so much that it would, I would ever think about staking it or anything like that. Um, and of course, 
like with most salvias, pollinators love this. Bees are all over it, hummingbirds love this. Um, so I have plans for this plant next year. Um, in fact, if you just watched my tour that I recently did, I'm not super happy with how my, what I call the, the, the patio bed, which is the skinny little bed alongside the house where I plant the big dahlias underneath the window box. I'm not very happy with how that turned out this year. So I'm already in my head thinking, okay, wasn't a great year for it. How can we make it better next year? And I think this plant might be key to it because I'm envisioning planting a whole bunch of this. And I think that could be pretty spectacular, especially because this color is gonna mix in great with the blue flowers that I love and just about any other color too. So absolute winner in my book. Um, and by the way, I can't wait to try it in containers because I think it'd be great in containers too. Last but certainly not least is this. I talked about this a lot in that tour video. I've grown it before and talked about it before. Plectranthus silver shield. Um, it is a foliage that I can't get enough of. Uh, because it is fuzzy, deer and rabbits are not interested. And it's this silvery gray fuzzy foliage. And it's just such a looker. Um, I wish more garden centers offered this. In fact, if you're a garden center, grow this because I couldn't find it this year. The one garden center locally who had it sold out of everything they had in like three days. It was hugely popular. Maybe that tells you you should be selling more of it. Um, now it does flower. It gets kind of spiky lavender flowers on it. Most people aren't going to be growing it for that and may even want to just cut those flowers off. I leave them in some places, cut them off in others. But this is such a great foil for everything else growing around it. But it's also, because it's got pretty big leaves on it, it can also really be a statement piece, um, either in a container or the ground, which is, I'm growing it in both. Um, now, the nice thing about this plant is that had I been a better planter last year, I wouldn't have had any issues because Plectranthus is a cousin to Coleus. And uh, so it does the same thing, which is that it roots extremely easily. So it's really easy to grow from cuttings. And in fact, you can, I have grown some of them from cuttings by you know, sticking them in water. I have also grown them from cuttings by pruning them off and literally sticking them straight into the ground and they grow. So that's how easy this is to root. So my plan for this year, rather than grow through the sort of trauma that I had to go through this year to find it. Um, and I ultimately had to find it. Somebody on Instagram helped me find it at a nursery in Kansas. And I called up that nursery and had them send me a box of it, which is kind of crazy. This year, I'm going to be a little smarter, take lots of cuttings, overwinter them. Um, even if the sort of mother plants that I'm growing don't do great, I will just keep taking cuttings. So I will always have fresh stock and that way I'll have as much Plectranthus Silver Shield as I could possibly want next year. So great plant and a must have for me. I don't ever see myself not having this in my garden. So that's seven notable annuals in my garden this year. But what I wanna know from you is, what's notable in your garden this year? Either because they're great or because they're not great or they're surprising you in some way. So leave me a comment below. Let me know about you know what is really kind of grabbing your attention this year for one reason or another. While you're at it, you guys, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button below, give it a thumbs up, a like, all those things, and we will catch you soon, but I can't wait to read about your annuals below. In the meantime, have a great time in your garden and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.